Hello everyone, my name is Florian Enner and I'm a software engineer at Heavy Robotics. And today I'm going to talk about real-time control. So first we'll establish a baseline of what we can expect from different systems. And then I will explain how we designed the modules and why we chose this architecture. Uh, lastly, we will cover some frequently asked questions. Uh, so the primary factors when talking about real-time control are latency and jitter. Um, latency is the delay between observation and the start of a reaction. And jitter is the variation in the delay of the receiver. So the general recommendation is usually that it should be as low as possible, but there's rarely any information about what's actually required. Uh, this is unfortunate because the effort versus latency curve has a pretty big cliff. There is a pretty reasonable level of latency that we can achieve with very minimal effort. Uh, however, at some point, it requires the use of specialized systems and the effort just grows exponentially from there. I would say the cliff is located somewhere around one millisecond. And there are many parts of robotics that definitely cross into the right side of the cliff, but it can save a lot of effort to look into the requirements and keep on the left side as much as possible. So let's first establish a baseline of what you can expect when working with various components. So first, we'll go over operating system jitter. Uh, we have different operating systems continuously sleep for a millisecond over a period of 24 hours and then measure the jitter of the resulting ticks. These were completely idle systems, so this is about the best you can expect uh, without a lot of the extra tuning or, or real-time extensions. So for consumer operating systems, we got results of below 3 milliseconds for Ubuntu and about 10 to 16 milliseconds for Windows and Mac. Uh, new Linux kernels perform even better, but it's roughly in the same ballpark. Next, we tested Scientific Linux with Red Hat's MRG real-time extension, or real-time Linux. And there, the worst case jitter went down to sub 150 microseconds, so an order of magnitude better. And lastly, we tested a dedicated microcontroller with a specialized real-time OS, or RTOS. And the results are expectedly very good, and we can get down to uh, levels of single-digit microseconds. So next, let's take a look at Ethernet networks. And we've done a variety of tests there, like daisy-chaining devices through 40 switches or having 40 devices on a single switch. And we found that the hardware is actually much more predictable than we expected. So most of the switching nowadays is implemented in hardware, and the jitter is practically non-existent on low load systems. So pretty much all of the added delays we see when sending messages between two hosts comes from the networking and driver stack of the operating system and the network card. Um, the results across operating systems are pretty comparable and we got about um, one millisecond to half a millisecond. And for comparison, the blue line on the bottom represents two embedded devices talking to each other. Uh, lastly, it's sometimes useful to control a system directly for Wi-Fi, but the performance depends on a lot of factors like the distance, obstacles, nearby Wi-Fi, and a lot more. So practically speaking, it can range from sub 10 milliseconds with zero packet loss to being very poor uh, with large st uh, spikes and massive packet loss. We also found some device-specific issues. So for example, um, the Galaxy S8 has a lot of latency spikes when connected to a 5 GHz Wi-Fi. The Galaxy S20 or like an iPhone, for example, would fare much better on the same network. And you can easily test the Wi-Fi performance using the latency plot and scope. And it's actually quite interesting to see how the latency changes when going to another room or being behind an open versus closed door. You can find a lot more details on the previous slides on my blog. So what level of performance do we actually need? We found that we can split the problems into two general sections. On the low end of the spectrum, we have the low level physical interactions like device drivers, motor controllers, safety features, PID loops, and so on. They can be in a microsecond to even sub microsecond range, and they really have to be implemented on a real time OS. On the high end, we have high level behaviors and full body coordination, like balancing or following some trajectory. And the requirements there depend a lot on the use case. So for example, a balancing robot like Igor would usually fall down if the latency goes beyond about 60 milliseconds. 
And when walking with a statically stable hexapod, like it could technically lose all communication for an extended period of time and still recover. So luckily, the high end is where most of the innovation happens, while device drivers mostly get written once and never change. So the way that we have architected our system is that we built um, smart actuators that can run all of these hard real-time tasks, including things like filtering on um, the IMU on a dedicated processor on each device. So that allows us to get rid of a central control box and lets users directly communicate via UDP messages through the APIs. So goals and trajectories are determined on a user PC and the resulting set targets for the internal position, velocity and torque controllers then get sent to the hardware. So typically user code would run at 100 Hertz to one kilohertz and the firmware would run tasks at one kilohertz and beyond. Um, we also timestamp uh, every message multiple times so that we can still build applications that require accurate DTs. So like common filters, for example. We also added various safety features to the actuators. So one thing that we found to be very important is to have a timeout that shuts down the robot once it stops receiving commands. This is especially important when adding velocity and torque control as the actuator would just keep spinning unpredictably in case the program crashes. And since an appropriate timeout depends on the configuration, we made the duration settable and send the so-called lifetime with each command. We also have various features that make sure that the motor won't overheat or um, otherwise break itself even if the user accidentally commands garbage. Okay, um, so the two most frequently asked questions that we get are related to global time synchronization and EFRCAT. Uh, on the time synchronization side, we initially thought that we will need global time synchronization at some point, but we found that the incoming feedback is already synchronized to about a millisecond, which is already good enough for, for what we need them for. And for most practical aspects like differentiating sensors, um, accurate local timestamps are, are typically sufficient. And next, we often get asked uh, why we chose Ethernet over the more deterministic EtherCAT. And the short answer is that it uses significant engineering re um, efforts to solve a problem that we really don't have. So EtherCAT was designed to handle, to allow a single master controller to do up to 10 kilohertz control of dumb devices over the network. So a dumb device would, for example, be a single digital output that really only has one bit of state and where it makes sense to combine multiple commands into a single message. And in our case, we already run distributed controllers that are robust to even several microseconds of jitter. So especially when adding velocity and torque control. So the improved determinism wouldn't make a difference. And each actuator also returns about 50 sensor measurements uh, so the package payload is already quite large. So it wouldn't make sense to combine multiple messages either. So at the end of the day, using EtherCAT would just make integration a lot harder. However, there are some good use cases in research. So for example, if you're building a robot where the master controller interfaces with hardware devices directly, or if you want to integrate with industrial equipment using Simulink real-time targets, or of course, if you're working in a field where it's um, mandatory like for regulatory reasons or because Maybe the, the customer, um, maybe that's what the customer always uses. Thank you.